A high protein diet is often recommended for health, fitness and body composition goals. But how much protein do you really need to consume? Is there a point at which more protein has no additional benefits? Can too much protein be detrimental? And do protein recommendations change depending on the specific goals you want to achieve? Before getting into how much protein we should aim to consume, we first need to clarify what protein intake refers to. Essentially, we are talking about the total daily amount of protein we consume each day from all sources. This includes protein from foods, drinks, and supplementation. So if you add up all the protein consumed from these sources, you get your total daily protein amount. For example, let's say a meal consisted of a chicken and vegetable stir-fry with white rice, plus an apple and a black tea with a little low-fat milk. The chicken in the stir-fry might contain around 28 grams of protein, the vegetables contribute 2 grams, the rice has 5 grams, there would even be a little protein in the stir-fry sauce, around 2 grams. Plus the apple would have a little, and the milk from the tea might have 2 grams. So the total protein intake of this meal would be 40 grams. And let's say another two similar meals were consumed each day for a total daily protein intake of 120 grams. And if you were to also throw a one scoop protein shake on top of your regular diet, now our protein intake is boosted to 145 grams. It is sometimes recommended to only count the protein from high quality sources and not consider what is known as trace protein. While there isn't a specific definition for these terms, high quality proteins are those with a more complete amino acid profile, while trace proteins are those with large deficiencies in some essential amino acids. Generally, animal-based proteins are considered higher quality, while plant-based proteins are considered lower quality. So in our previous meal example, the protein in the chicken and milk would be considered the high quality protein, while the protein from the rice, vegetables, stir fry sauce, and apple would be considered trace protein. The theory is that since animal proteins have a more complete amino acid profile, they are thought to have more of a benefit for muscle building and performance goals. Whereas, since plant-based proteins are often lacking in some of the essential amino acids, they have been thought to be less beneficial for body composition and performance goals. However, recent evidence tends to find that as long as total daily protein intake is sufficient, the source that the protein comes from doesn't seem to impact body composition changes to any meaningful extent. This was seen in this study, which compared the effects of a vegan versus omnivorous diet on muscle growth during a resistance training program. 19 habitually vegan men and 19 habitual omnivores performed the same lower body resistance training protocol two times per week for 12 weeks. Subjects consumed their regular habitual diet plus additional soy or whey protein powder to bump their total daily protein intake to at least 1.6 grams per kilogram of body weight per day. And as we can see, both groups ended up consuming around 1.7 grams of protein per kilogram per day throughout the study period. Although, despite total daily protein intake being roughly equated, the vegans still consumed around 10 grams fewer essential amino acids compared with the omnivores. Although, this didn't seem to influence muscle growth. After 12 weeks, gains in total lean mass of the legs were similar between groups. And as another metric of muscle growth, individual muscle fibre cross-sectional area of the rectus femoris and vastus lateralis increased similarly in both groups with no significant differences between them. While this doesn't completely rule out the potential influence of protein quality, it seems that total daily protein intake is far more important than the specific source that the protein is derived from when it comes to muscle growth. So for this video, we will be referring to total daily protein, including all sources, when making recommendations. The next topic we need to preface before determining protein intake is what metric we will use to prescribe protein amounts. Protein is usually quantified in grams, but an absolute number of grams of protein isn't universally applicable to everyone. This is because people weigh different amounts, have different calorie and macronutrient requirements, and have different body compositions. So instead of prescribing absolute protein amounts, it makes more sense to prescribe protein relative to body weight. This is prescribed as grams per kilogram or pound of body weight per day. 
This still isn't a perfect metric because people can have different amounts of muscle mass and body fat at the same body weight. We will discuss how to scale protein intakes based on body composition later in the video, but for now we will simply be using the metric of grams per kilogram or pound of body weight per day. The first topic to discuss protein intake for is muscle growth. When it comes to muscle growth, higher protein intakes tend to be superior up to a point. And beyond this point, higher protein intakes seem to have less additional benefit. There are two meta-analyses we can look at which demonstrate a similar finding. This first one aimed to evaluate the effects of total daily protein intake on gains in lean mass. Across a total of 105 studies including over 5,000 subjects, the relationship looked something like this. Higher protein intakes tend to be beneficial for increasing lean mass, but the relationship is not linear. Once total daily protein intake surpasses around 1.3 grams per kilogram of body weight per day, there seems to be less additional benefit from consuming more. Although it should be noted that this relationship included studies with all different populations and most of them without resistance training. So as a slightly more specific paper, this meta-analysis explored the effects of protein supplementation on gains in muscle mass while simultaneously performing resistance training. A breakpoint analysis found that protein supplementation was beneficial for gains in fat-free mass up to a point. However, once total daily protein intake exceeded around 1.6 grams per kilogram per day, additional protein supplementation had minimal additional benefit. So based on the data we have, I would say that the relationship between protein intake and muscle growth probably looks something like this. More is generally beneficial, but there is likely diminishing returns. As a practical recommendation, those who want to maximize muscle growth should probably aim to consume at least around 1.5 grams per kilogram or 0.7 grams per pound of body weight per day of total protein. And if you want to get every last percentage of potential gains possible, you might want to opt for an even higher intake of around 2 grams per kilogram or 0.9 grams per pound. On a similar topic, let's now explore how much protein we should consume for the purposes of fat loss. Protein intake has two roles in the fat loss process. The first is for muscle retention. Similar to muscle growth, a high protein diet can help us provide a more anabolic environment during a calorie deficit. This generally results in a greater proportion of muscle being retained while losing weight, and therefore a greater proportion of fat being lost. According to this research review, most weight loss diets typically result in about 75% of the lost weight coming from fat, with around 25% coming from lean mass. However, a high protein diet seems to somewhat mitigate the amount of lean mass lost, leading to a greater proportion of fat loss. Although we should also be aware that a high protein intake alone shouldn't be the primary method we rely on to preserve muscle mass. Resistance training is far more effective at promoting muscle growth or preservation than our protein intake. This was seen in this study, which compared the effects of protein intake and or resistance training on body composition changes during weight loss. 100 overweight or obese adults followed a diet designed to be 600 calories below their estimated energy needs for 10 weeks. Subjects were split into four groups one consuming a lower protein intake of 0.8 grams per kilogram per day, one consuming a higher protein intake of 1.3 grams per kilogram per day, the third group consuming a lower protein intake but also performing resistance training three times per week, and the last group consuming a higher protein intake plus performing resistance training three times per week. After 10 weeks, all groups lost significant body weight. The lower and high protein intake groups approximately maintained all their fat-free mass. The group exercising saw a slight increase in fat-free mass, and therefore a greater proportion of fat loss. And the high protein plus exercise group saw an even greater increase in fat-free mass, and therefore an even greater proportion of fat loss. So how much protein should we aim to consume for the goal of muscle preservation? This was explored in this study, which compared the effects of different protein intakes during a calorie deficit on body composition changes. 39 military personnel from the US Army performing their regular physical activity schedule were assigned to a 40% calorie restricted diet for 3 weeks. 
One group were assigned to consume the recommended dietary protein intake of 0.8 grams per kilogram of body weight per day. Another group consumed double this amount, 1.6 grams per kilogram per day, and the third group consumed triple the RDA at 2.4 grams per kilogram per day. After three weeks, all groups lost significant body weight. However, the low protein group lost a greater proportion of fat-free mass, meaning they lost a lower proportion of fat mass. While the moderate and high protein groups retained a greater amount of fat-free mass and therefore lost a greater proportion of fat mass. Although the differences were similar between the 2 times and 3 times RDA protein groups. So I would say that the amount of protein you would want to consume to maximize muscle preservation would be about the same as the recommendations made for muscle growth. You could argue that a slightly higher relative protein intake could be beneficial during weight loss to offset the catabolic environment caused by the calorie deficit, but I wouldn't say this is much different. I would still recommend to try and intake a minimum of 1.5 grams per kilogram per day of protein to maximize muscle retention during weight loss. And more importantly, ensure this is being achieved alongside a hypertrophy stimulating resistance training routine. And another commonly reported benefit of a high protein diet is its ability to promote greater satiety. There is some evidence suggesting that high protein foods are more satiating in isolation than high fat or high carbohydrate foods. Although the protein content alone isn't the sole determinant of what makes a food more satiating. This was observed in this classic study which compared the satiety effects of various different foods. A 240 calorie serving of 38 different individual foods were provided to healthy young adults in the morning after an overnight fast. Subjects then rated their subjective satiety every 15 minutes for the following two hours after consuming the food. As expected, fruits, vegetables, lean proteins, and high fiber carbohydrate sources were generally found to be the most satiating, while high fat sweets and cakes were generally found to be least satiating. The researchers also looked at the relationships between satiety and different food characteristics. Foods higher in fat were less satiating, as we would expect, since fat has the highest calorie density per gram. While foods higher in protein, fiber, and water content were all more satiating in general. And the amount of carbohydrate and starch a food contained had minimal impact on its satiety response. So from this, we would expect that a high protein diet is going to help us be more satiated. While this might be true to some extent, this doesn't always seem to be the case when extrapolated from individual food sources to the diet as a whole, or at least not to the same magnitude as these findings suggest. For example, this study tested if a high protein diet increases satiety during a calorie deficit compared with a calorie matched lower protein diet. 17 overweight women consumed a diet consisting of 1250 calories per day for 6 consecutive days on 2 separate occasions. On one occasion, they consumed a normal protein diet containing 48 grams per day. Half the subjects consumed a plant-based diet, while the other half consumed animal products, but all macronutrients were the same. And on the other occasion, they consumed a high-protein diet containing 124 grams per day, but with the same total calorie intake. On the last day of the diet, hunger and satiety scores were taken every 30 minutes for 12 hours. It was found that overall hunger was similar between all three conditions, with slightly less hunger seen in the high protein condition. Similarly, fullness ratings were similar, with the high protein condition showing slightly greater overall fullness scores. So overall, a high protein diet might have a small advantage in promoting greater satiety. And hypothetically, this would result in consuming a slightly lower total calorie intake in a free living setting. Or it may mean that you are able to adhere better to a calorie deficit. This can be beneficial as adherence to a calorie deficit is the most important factor for fat loss. Although it is difficult to give a specific recommendation here, I would say to at least make sure your protein intake isn't too low to a point where it is inhibiting your overall satiety. As a practical recommendation, we probably want to get at least 1 gram per kilogram of body weight per day for the satiety benefits. Next, let's discuss how much protein we should consume for strength gains. 
The protein intake required to maximize strength seems to be similar to that of muscle growth and muscle retention. This is probably because protein benefits strength via its positive effects on muscle growth. This meta-analysis aimed to explore the relationship between total daily protein intake and gains in strength. Using data from 69 articles, it was found that protein intakes up to around 1.5 grams per kilogram per day appear to have a significant positive benefit for strength gains. However, beyond this point, there doesn't seem to be any significant benefits. So once again, to maximize strength, we probably want to aim for a minimum protein intake of around 1.5 grams per kilogram per day. Although it is unclear if higher protein intakes than this would promote further strength gains like we see with muscle growth. And lastly, let's discuss how much protein is needed for health purposes. This is a difficult question to answer because there are many different components which comprise overall health. Physical function, body composition, cognitive ability, mental health, disease risk and more all relate to our overall health and ultimately our mortality risk. This meta-analysis explored the effects of total daily, animal, and plant protein intake on mortality risk. It was found that a higher total daily protein intake is associated with a lower all-cause mortality risk up to a point. The lowest mortality risk was seen in those consuming a diet consisting of around 15-20% to of their total calories coming from protein. And looking more specifically at the type of protein consumed, those consuming more than around 10% of their total calories from animal-based protein had a slightly higher mortality risk. And those consuming more protein from plant-based sources had a lower mortality risk. So it is difficult to provide very specific recommendations here, but according to Dietitians Australia, a lack of protein in the diet can inhibit muscle development, cause oedema, promote anemia, and delay growth in children. For health purposes, they recommend a minimum intake of somewhere around 0.75 to 1 gram per kilogram per day of protein depending on the population. So as a practical guideline, a total protein intake of somewhere around 0.8 to 1.2 grams per kilogram per day is probably going to be ideal for health purposes in most cases. And going too far beyond this point might be slightly detrimental for overall health, especially if the excess protein comes from animal sources. So far we have been discussing protein intake in relative terms, as the number of grams per kilogram or pound of body weight per day. Although these numbers are just averages. In reality, protein requirements are probably based more so on lean mass rather than total body weight. This means that if your body fat is higher, you probably don't need as much relative protein, and if your body fat is lower, then you probably need a higher relative protein intake. So for all the recommendations we have discussed, they should be scaled based on body fat. Here is a table which scales protein based on biological sex and body fat percentage. These numbers are how much you can adjust the protein recommendations we have discussed in terms of grams per kilogram of body weight per day. Females should scale their relative protein intake a little lower, while males should scale them a little higher, since females naturally carry a higher body fat percentage at the same body weight in most cases. From there, we can increase or decrease relative protein intakes based on body fat percentage. As we can see, females with a higher body fat can scale their protein requirements down the most, while leaner males should scale their relative protein requirements up the most. This table uses grams per kilogram per day, while this presents the same table using grams per pound per day, for those who use pounds as a unit to measure body weight. And lastly, let's discuss a practical concern that might influence how much protein we aim to consume. While a moderate to high protein diet seems to have numerous benefits, a very high protein diet might have some practical limitations. There are two potential issues that chasing a very high protein intake might cause. First is that being fixated on a very high protein target might cause you to eat more total calories than you otherwise would. This can result in unwanted body fat gains or a failure to adhere to a calorie deficit if you are attempting to reduce body fat. And second is that it can simply make the diet less preferable. You may not enjoy eating a large amount of lean protein with each meal and consuming lots of protein supplementation. 
This can also make the diet more rigid, making it more stressful to eat at social events. So in many cases, going too high with your protein intake can create more issues than the benefits it provides, especially if you are on a calorie restricted diet. To summarize, let's establish some practical recommendations. For muscle growth, strength and muscle retention during weight loss, more protein is generally beneficial. However, once we exceed a total daily intake of around 1.5 grams per kilogram per day, significant diminishing returns exist. Whereas for overall health, a more moderate protein intake of around 0.8 to 1.2 grams per kilogram per day seems to be more appropriate. And it seems that getting more protein from plant-based sources tends to promote better health outcomes too. We should also make sure to scale these recommendations based on body fat. Females with a higher body fat percentage have lower relative protein requirements, while leaner males have higher relative protein requirements. And it should also be noted that a very high protein intake might make your diet less sustainable. Chasing a high protein intake might unintentionally result in a higher calorie intake, or it might just make your diet overall less preferable and less flexible. So it is important to make your protein target something that you are feasibly able to meet to maximize long-term adherence. Thanks for watching and hopefully you got something out of this video. Check out flowhighperformance.com for online coaching, training templates, ebooks and more.